So we just got done hearing Mr. Edwards talk about how we can put ourselves in caves with people that are just like us. We just heard from um, Gabby and, and Haley talk about how we can identify ourselves with temporary circumstances, but we can move beyond that. We don't have to identify ourselves with those temporary circumstances. And we just heard Paige talk about empathy and having a different perspective. And you might look at my title and what can, what can geometry teach us about ourselves and, and ask the question, and ask the question, how can that possibly relate to the things that we've just heard about, dealing with perspective on political issues and eating disorders and all of these other kinds of things? Well, I would, I would suggest to you that it actually offers more than you think and connects in ways that you might not expect. And so I invite you to, to go with me on a journey and engage with me in this talk where we talk about the assumptions that we make and how the things that we know are highly dependent on the things that we come into uh, those situations with. Mr. Edwards talked about how, for instance, we need to be sure that we recognize that we don't know everything. I would submit and go even further that we don't know anything. Everything you think you know is dependent upon assumptions that you're making. So, let's start with a, a bit of an activity here. I have a, a little geography, right? I said it was going to be geometry, we're going to start with geography. I've got two maps. Map of the United States on the, on the left there, and a map of Europe on the right. And I have a question for you, just to test your intuition. So, Pittsburgh, you know, we're all familiar with Pittsburgh, we're right there, right? That's one city. And we're going to pick another city in Europe. I'm going to choose Madrid down here, right? We've got the rest of Europe, Africa, right? Madrid right in the center of Spain. And I want to ask you the following question. How far north of Madrid is Pittsburgh? Obviously, there's a bit of east to west difference as well, right? But how far north of Madrid do you think Pittsburgh is? And I'll give you three choices, right? A, less than 100 miles. B, between 100 and 500 miles or C, more than 500 miles. And just as a point of reference, uh, 100 miles, if you're thinking about Pittsburgh, Erie, PA, is about 100 miles north of us, and Charleston, South Carolina, is about 500 miles south of us. Okay? And then on the flip side, if you're looking at Europe, uh, Paris is about 500 miles north of Madrid, and London is about 750 miles north of Madrid. Okay, so, again, I'll ask the question, how far north of Madrid is Pittsburgh? So just by a show of hands, just kind of see, how many people think less than 100 miles? Okay, a few of you, a lot of you. Good, how many between 100 and 500 miles? Okay, about a, maybe a third. And how many think more than 500 miles? Okay, maybe uh, an eighth or so. Maybe. So it looked like most of us said less than 100 miles, which is good, your intuition is very good. Uh, not only is it less than 100 miles, it is two miles. Madrid is two miles south of Pittsburgh. So actually, and since we are about seven miles south of Pittsburgh ourselves, we are south of Madrid in our seats right now. Okay, And that might be uh, a little counterintuitive because we, we, you know, the way I presented it, uh, I presented the maps in such a way that Pittsburgh it looks significantly north the way I've lined them up. Um, but two miles, I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay? And it makes me think about pilots, right? If I were a pilot for an airline and I had my co-pilot with me, I would think the Pittsburgh to Madrid flight would be a pretty good gig, right? Like you get in your plane, you point it east, you land, right? They're both exactly at 40 degrees latitude. <laughs> Right? Like, here it is, right? Go east, cross the ocean. When you get to a big city, you stop, right? Easiest direction of all time, right? Uh, and some of you, you might be a little too young for this, but you might have seen it in your parents. Um, certainly this way in my family. When we go on a trip, one person kind of just thinks they know how to go, right? They know how to get where they're going. And the other person wants to check Google Maps and make sure they have the exact directions and are, you know, have everything totally planned out, right? So I imagine my pilot and co-pilot together here, right? The pilot says, look, all I have to do, get in the plane, point it east, land in 10 hours, we're done. The co-pilot saying, yeah, let's check Google Maps, just to be safe. 
Right? What do you mean Google Maps? It's a straight line, east. You don't even have to turn at all. What do we need a map for? You know, really, I'd be more comfortable to check Google Maps. So, you know, Copilot gets up his phone, right? And this is what Google Maps says. And this is actually what Google Maps says. This is courtesy this, of Google Maps. So Google Maps says, yeah, uh, you don't go east. You, you, uh, you go to Canada first, and then you kind of hang a, a right and go down to Madrid. Huh? Canada? Why would I go through Canada to get to Madrid? Is there like construction in the Mid-Atlantic? <laughs> They're riding me around here? Or what? No, what's going on here, right? And so I actually tried to find an actual flight path from an actual flight, and uh, this is what I found. And uh, $1,300 flight, I'm not sure if that's round trip or one way, but 10 hours, $1,300 flight. Uh, they don't go quite to Canada, but they also don't go straight east, so I imagine our pilot and co-pilot kind of looked at that picture, looked at that picture and said, well, let's just split the difference. <laughs> but no, this is actually the correct way, okay? Going up to Canada, and if any of you have flown to Europe, you might have actually noticed, sometimes they show you on the backs of the seats, your flight path, and you can see where you're flying over. Uh, yeah, you would actually fly over Canada to go to Madrid. Why? Why? That doesn't make sense, right? It's a straight line. Or is it a straight line? So this is where the geometry comes in. This is where the assumptions that we make affect what we think we know, okay? And so, Stepping into some geometry, you know, to we'll do this quickly to not bore you, but all of the geometry you learned in high school, some of you are in geometry right now, is based on five postulates. And postulates is just a fancy word for assumptions, okay? Five assumptions. And we're not going to go through them in detail. There's only two of these that we want to look at, the first one and the last one. The first one says a straight line segment can be drawn between any two points. That's clear, right? When you think straight line segment, you think, oh, I get out a ruler and I draw a straight line. That's not what straight line means. Straight line means the shortest distance between two points. Whatever that looks like. If it doesn't look like a straight line to you, but it's the shortest distance between two points, it means your perspective is wrong, okay? That's the shortest distance between Pittsburgh and Madrid. If it doesn't look straight to you, that's because you have the wrong perspective, okay? On the left, we're looking at the, the globe, if you will, from a perspective of the 40th latitude line. On the right, we're looking at the path as it would be if we're looking right at it, right? And on the right, you can see that that looks much more like a straight line than it does on the left. And it's actually the 40 degree latitude line that looks more curved, okay? So we need a change in perspective if what we see doesn't match what our definitions say, okay? So, Straight line segment is the shortest distance between two points. The other ones I'm not really too concerned about. Uh, straight line segment can be extended in either direction forever. We can draw circles. All right angles are congruent. And lastly, the one I have in red, given a line and a point not on that line, there is exactly one line parallel to the given line. That's, that's kind of a mouthful, and that's in red for a reason. All four of these other assumptions are very simple, right? All right angles are congruent. Yeah, that, that seems on its face true, right? A straight line segment can be drawn between two points. That's simple. It seems on its face true. This last one is complicated, right? There's a lot going on there. All it's saying is if you have a line and you have another point off of that line, there's only one line that's parallel through that point. But it doesn't sit well with the other four. And for a long time, you know, Euclid lived in ancient Greece, right? And he compiled this list, he didn't come up with it himself. And for a long time, people tried really hard to prove the fifth one based on the other four, not assuming it to be true, because they didn't like it, it didn't sit well, it was too complicated, it wasn't a simple assumption. But nobody, nobody could prove the fifth postulate based on the other four. And so we had to assume it as the fifth postulate. If we didn't assume it as the fifth postulate, all of the geometry that you learned fell apart. The Pythagorean theorem, triangles having 180 degrees, uh, CPT, CTC, your favorite, right? Angle side angle, all the alternate interior angles, vertical angles being through, none of that stuff 
work without having that fifth postulate added to the other four. And so we needed that fifth postulate. So nobody felt good about it. But it seemed to do all right. It seemed to work. It seemed to work, that is, until things like this. Okay? And this is the assumption that is wrong in this case. Because it's not true that in all cases, at all times, there is exactly one line parallel to a given line through a point not on that line. If we look at the picture specifically on the right, and we see the line connecting Madrid and Pittsburgh, that line is actually a circle on the Earth. It's called a great circle. It's a circle whose center is the center of the Earth itself. Okay? There are lots of great circles on the Earth. Actually, every longitude line that you see, north-south line, is a great circle as well. It goes all the way around the Earth. It centers the, the center of the Earth. But you'll notice, you would think all lines that are going north are parallel, right? They're going the same direction. But are they parallel? No, because parallel lines never meet. Where do all north-south lines meet? Two places, actually. The North Pole and the South Pole. And actually, any two great circles will meet in two places on the Earth and won't be parallel. And so on a sphere, like the one we live on, there are no such things as parallel lines. They don't exist. A line is the shortest distance between two points, by definition. On a sphere, those lines are circles, great circles. And all great circles intersect twice. There are no parallel lines. This, number five, is a bad assumption. Okay? And that assumption has consequences. Some of those consequences are that for that fifth postulate, triangles have 180 degrees. But here's a triangle on a sphere. It's got a right angle right there. It's got another right angle right there. And it's got a third right angle right there. But you know, you know that all triangles have 180 degrees, right? That triangle has 270 degrees. And it is a triangle, make no mistake. It's a triangle. Not only that, it's a right triangle. Actually, it's a triply right triangle because all the angles are right. Guess what else doesn't work? The Pythagorean theorem. Something you know. You know that the Pythagorean theorem is true. No, it's not. It's true in certain situations. Okay? It's true under a certain set of assumptions. And this isn't a trick, right? This isn't a trick. This is a separate type of geometry that is just as valid as what we call Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is the, is the geometry of flat spaces. Okay? Flat planes. This is the geometry of curved spaces. It's valid. We live on one. There are other geometries as well that follow different sets of assumptions. Okay? Now, how does this, so what? Great. Geometry, assumptions, right? These assumptions have consequences, but assumptions don't just have consequences in geometry. They have assumptions all over the place, right? In our daily life, the way we interact with each other. Okay? Next one. So, let's make a, a little bit easier one, a little more familiar, okay? Euclidean geometry. This is Euclidean geometry. We're not on a sphere. Okay, I don't want to confuse anybody. Hopefully, this is a familiar equation to you. I want to know which shape matches that equation. Okay? X squared plus Y squared equals 16. We should know that equation, I think, most of us. On the left, I've got a square-like shape. On the right, I've got a circle-like shape. Okay? How many think it's a square? Not a single hand. Okay, so... I mean, I think it's a circle. Yeah, pretty much everybody. Some people are a little uh, wary. Yeah. Um, so if I told you that the square is wrong, you wouldn't be surprised by that, right? Good. What if I told you the circle is wrong? What if I told you they're actually both right in some sense? We're making an assumption here too. And it's a more subtle assumption because it's an assumption we don't even know we're making. It's an assumption that's hidden. We're assuming that we're dealing with a two-dimensional shape. And there are actually some clues. There's some 
I, I put some clues up there to see if people would notice. The axes are backwards on one of the lines, actually. You might have noticed that, I don't know. Um, like y is negative one over there, that's not right. Hmm, makes us think maybe something's not right here. This is a three dimensional shape. And in three dimensions, the equation x squared plus y squared equals 16 is not a circle. It's a cylinder. So we take that circle and we tilt it and we see, oh, that there's an extra third dimension, it's a cylinder. And actually part way through the tilting, we see that if we look at it straight on, it actually looks kind of like a square, right? If we're looking at it from a distance. Okay? And so the perspective which with, with which we look at this shape affects what we see. So what's the point? The point is that we bring the substance into every single situation that we come into. And then a lot of times we aren't even sure, we don't even recognize that we're bringing those assumptions in. Okay? And we assume that what's true for us in the situations that we're in is true for everybody. But that's not the case. Or it's even true for us in other situations that might be different. And lastly, we assume that our perspective is the correct one, when there are other equally valid perspectives. And so, what are the possible consequences of that? Well, we can see, right? We can see that we will miss solutions to problems and that we won't have empathy and understanding with each other, okay? And that um, we can fail to, uh, we can be manipulated by those who are providing us information. Mr. Edwards talked about the fact that it's easy to get information from people who agree with you. Well, it's easy to be manipulated by people that don't give you the full story. I didn't tell you there was a third dimension. I was preying upon your assumption that it's a two-dimensional shape because I know that's what you were going to assume, and so I fed into that, right? If we're not aware of the assumptions we're making, we fall victim to that kind of manipulation, okay? So I would challenge you, I would urge you, that the next time you disagree with someone, or a group of people, you don't do the easy thing. You don't label them as wrong. You don't do the easy thing and lump them in a group with a label that you dismiss out of hand. You ask yourself two questions. One, what assumptions am I bringing into this situation that's causing my perspective to be a certain way and causing me to reason that way? And two, and this is the harder one, what assumptions might they be bringing to the table that's causing them to see it in such a weird way to me? It's easy to say, all the people that see the square are wrong. All the people that see the circle are wrong. Because I can see that it's not what they say. But can you step back and try to see what their perspective is to see why they think that way? Because if you do, then you can see that you might be not maybe wrong, but incompletely correct. You see a circle, it's a cylinder. They see a square, it's a cylinder. You both have elements of correctness to you. You step back with a bigger perspective, and you get the better picture. Thank you.